going to do today is continue our study in Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to ask that you turn to page 1801 in your pew Bible. 1801, Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 to 20 is the passage most notable on spiritual warfare. Fighting the schemes of Satan. The commands that we are given, there are strategies here, commands, there are promises, and there are pieces of armor. There are also weapons at our disposal. And consequently, Christian, you find yourself in a fight whether you like it or not. There's really no neutrality in this if you are walking with the Lord. And even if you are not, we'll talk about that at the end of the message. So let's turn to Ephesians 10. I'm going to read the entirety. Verses 10 to 20. The title of today's message is Fighting with Prayer, as we will review verses 18 to 20. That will be our focus. Hear the word of God. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now today's text. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. The primary focus we see is in verse 10, that the people of God, Christians, are to be strong in the Lord, strong in His power. It's been an amazing letter, many blessings. It opens up with spiritual blessings. We see the restoration of people groups of Jew and Gentile now into one, previously dead in sin and transgressions, but now one in Christ. We see many promises on how we are to live. A generally very optimistic epistle, but now we see something that we must do as well. So we see the objective here to stand strong. And how are we going to do that? by putting on the whole armor of God. And with the strength is protection, so that we may be able to stand against our enemy, Satan. So that you may be able to stand against the enemy of your soul, Christian. And we see who else we are fighting here, not just Satan in verse 12. We see that there are principalities and powers. There are minions, part of the demonic army, if you will that comes against the army of God. We see that this is not a flesh and blood enemy here, that this is a spiritual enemy that we are dealing with. So what are we to do in verse 13? We take up the whole armor that we may be able to withstand in the evil day. Now the armor we see in 14 to 17, we see five specific pieces of armor. But what I would argue here that we see the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, is a weapon. And what we're going to look at today, in addition, is a weapon at your disposal. A weapon that is of great necessity to you in this battle, and that is the weapon of prayer. 
Now, Christian, be strong. And we see the Roman soldier. We see armor. We see the posture of standing firm. But there's a way that you get to stand firm. You stand strong when you're on your knees. You stand strong in the power of God. Strength for battle comes through surrender. It may appear as a paradox. See, the Christian soldier is strongest and standing strongest when they're also kneeling, if you will, daily in prayer. You're going to win the spiritual battle in the victory of Christ. You're going to win the daily battles by submitting yourself to God. James 4, 7. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. And there's no greater submission, perhaps, in the whole Bible than prayer. Prayer, submission. So now, the paradox we see here throughout the letter and in the New Testament is this strength given to the Christian. There is strength in your weakness. He will hold you fast. He is your strength. He is the power to fight this battle. This non-negotiable battle that we all find ourselves in. So, after describing the pieces of armor, he now see the weapon. Paul closes this warfare out with prayer. Now, as a Christian, there are many reasons why you ought to pray. Prayer is a general practice for all in Christ. In all facets of life, and prayer may have many applications, but what we're going to see as the text ends with a focused and specific prayer to pray one for another and pray that the gospel may advance as well. Two primary purposes. When it comes to prayer, in addition, understand that this weapon is a supernatural weapon. We fight a supernatural war with a supernatural enemy. Understand that the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. They're not carnal, but they're mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. And understand that prayer is just that. So in order to stand strong, in order to stand firm, yes, you put on the armor of God. Yes, you have the strategy here. Yes, you see the commands, but we must pray as well. Submission and total dependence to God. Think about the posture of prayer. Now, you can pray any which way you want. Just think about the whole ideology, the whole mindset, the whole Christian practice. You're calling out to God. And particularly here in this passage, we're calling out to Him for strength and instruction. We're calling out to Him for power that we simply do not have on our own. Now, what is prayer? Now, in a general sense, we'll look at prayer from the Westminster Confession of Faith. Prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God in the name of Christ, by the help of His Spirit, with confession of our sins and thankful acknowledgement of His mercies. Many have said that prayer simply is communication with God. And in this warfare, the Christian soldier needs that walkie-talkie, if you will, to the commander-in-chief on a daily basis. We must draw our strength from God, our instruction, and our reliance, and a lot of it comes through prayer. So let's look at verse 18, the practice of prayer. How are you to pray in light of this battle? Verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication. Praying always, let's break down the phrase, well, there's a frequency in prayer. The Christian should be praying always in some capacity with all prayer and supplication. Now we see praying always that we ought to be persistent, prioritizing prayer, being steadfast in the practice of prayer. It should be non-negotiable. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 tells us to pray without ceasing. So we're to pray in times when things are going well, 
But you probably find yourself most often praying when things are, quote unquote, not going so well. We should never depend on circumstances in our lives to dictate our practice of prayer. Now, what happens if we are prayerlessness and not praying in this frequency? Now, don't try this at home, okay? Take it from me. There have been times when I've prayed less, when I'm not praying always, that I'm not frequent in prayer. And I will tell you that I am certainly not stronger but weaker. I'm certainly not sharper, but I am duller as a Christian. So many different ways to pray. We see praying always with prayer and supplication. There's a variety of prayers that we are to pray. And there are many different ways to pray. Now I'm using the terminology strength and kneeling because that's most notable for prayer. But you can pray standing. The Bible tells us praying, laying down on your bed at night, in the morning, long prayers, short prayers, all kinds of prayers. Different types of prayers in the Bible. And generally, we can pray prayers of adoration, thanksgiving, lamentation, prayers of repentance, prayers for our needs, petitions. But what we're going to see here is a specific prayer. This is called an intercessory prayer. And Paul was very, very forthright with his intercessory prayers. And he was specific about them as well. Now, we see that this falls into this prayer here, the category of intercession. And that is something that we devote ourselves to in praying for someone else, praying one for another. And in doing so, we take the focus off ourselves, which can be healthy, as a parenthetical note sometimes. We divert our attention from maybe our own situations, maybe our own issues. That's not to say that we shouldn't be praying, but to pray for others. Now we are to pray Phrase here, always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Now, someone here may get a knee-jerk reaction and say, you mean I'm to pray in tongues? No, that's not what the passage is saying. This is not correct here. Now, we see this phrase, praying in the spirit, twice. And when we unravel this, we see it in this verse here. We also see it in Jude. But you, beloved, building yourselves up, on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Before I tell you what it is and could possibly be, because there are people on different sides interpretively here, I'll tell you what it's not. It's not tongues, and I'll give you the reason why. Praying at all times, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Has anyone in the Bible ever prayed always in tongues? The answer is no. Is everyone here, I don't have the gift of tongues, never did. So am I not supposed to pray? Someone here may have never had the gift of tongues. There's debate if there even is the gift of tongues still. So that's not what it is, number one. Number two, it's not praying in tongues if that's your knee-jerk reaction because it's not contextually viable with the letter. Paul would not just come out of the blue under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and say, meaning pray in tongues. There's nothing in the letter. He would not have just referenced it. There's nothing before, there's nothing after. So we have to understand how there's walking in the Spirit, and we see here praying in the Spirit. Now, what this probably means here, without going into great length, by means of help with the Spirit, when our prayers are moved and guided by the Holy Spirit, when we are praying in the spirit. It's a spirit-influenced prayer. It'll be a biblical prayer. It'll be a God-centered prayer. It'll be an other-centered prayer as well. Let me additionally tell you what praying in the spirit is not, as Jesus said in Matthew 6, 7. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard by their many words. So that's not what it is as well. It's praying from an innermost place, Many have referenced Romans 8, 26, and 27. But I would say this in conclusion. It's to pray generally now. It's to pray in harmony with God's word, which he has inspired. And God is going to cause you to pray in light of his will. And he will never pray us 
ask us to pray for something outside of Scripture. So pray at all times, always, with all variety of prayers in the Spirit. Pray biblical prayers, God-honoring prayers. In addition to how, the practice of prayer, we see another phrase here. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication. Being watchful. We are to pray, spiritual warfare prayer, being watchful, staying alert. This is simply beyond just checking the box to say, I prayed today. This is a specific prayer, devoting yourself to some specifics here. And it's the specific of praying constantly as well. You're being watchful. You're being discerning. And I would say this. In war, there are sometimes preemptive attacks. And Satan will come against you. We don't know specifically the hour or when, but he's coming against you. We know that. Preemptive attack could appear like, I didn't expect that coming. That's why we should have preemptive prayer. Now, what I mean is a preemptive war strike is commenced in an attempt to get someone to attack them by surprise. But if we are prayed up, if you will, we'll be ready for that. Now, preemptive prayer is taken as a measure against something possible. Let's anticipate that Satan will strike, and when we are prayed up, the strength will be there to endure. An example of preemptive prayer was found in Jesus telling his disciples before, during the Olivet Discourse in Luke 21, what I would, feel, what I would argue was the temple was going to be destroyed. He said to his disciples, watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass, to stand before the Son of Man. In Matthew 26, 41, he offers another admonition. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. And we see a preemptive prayer in the Lord's Prayer. Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So we do not want to wait for the hour of battle to be praying. We want to be preemptive. Now we see the second point here is the people. The people of prayer in the text. Who are the people we are praying for? Well, for all the saints and for Paul. And it's got application for us here today. Though the saints at Ephesus are no longer on the earth, nor is Paul, will make the application for each and every one of us here in this room. For all the saints we see, we ought to pray for the saints. Let me read the verse for you. Pray with all supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. And he's going to say in verse 19, pray for me as well. So who are the saints? Well, maybe you're new to the faith. And maybe you have a misunderstanding of who the saints are. Maybe you've come out of Roman Catholicism. And let me just tell you, on no uncertain terms, like many other things, they've distorted that in their teachings as well. A saint is a Christian. A saint is one who's called out, separated from the world, called out of darkness into light. A saint is someone with the Holy Spirit. A saint is those who call Christ as Lord. So we are to pray for all the saints. Now there's a principle at, at hand here. During spiritual warfare, you've heard the term in any sort of war, stronger together. There's strength in numbers. When we are praying one for another, we are stronger together. We have to pray with those who we are unified in spirit with, those who we are going to battle with, those with the same common mission, all the saints. And we must employ teamwork. When soldiers go out to battle, there is sometimes a stance and a tactic where they will say, you've got to cover my back. And we've got to do that one to another here in spiritual warfare as well. We all have the same common purposes, the all same common mission, and we all part of the army of the Lord. Now, the greatest and strongest of all the saints and the most tactical of all the saints is never called to fight alone, never called to fight 
because they are so strong or so tactical. The strength comes from God, and we are to fight together one for another. Where the armor was individual, it's our duty to put on the armor of God as we looked at. It's also our duty now. That's individual to have this collective attitude where we pray one for another. Intercessory prayer on behalf of others. Now, ask someone today before you leave, how can I pray for you this week? Someone, look to the left of you, to the right of you. Maybe you're not going to say anything, and that's fine. How do I pray for you? You must ask yourself that question. I don't know what to pray for you. Well, there's general prayers. But always remember this. If you don't know what to pray for the saint next to you, your sister and brother, follow the pattern of Paul. Follow what we're doing on Wednesday nights when we're praying in our prayer In our prayer meeting, we are looking at a prayer of Paul. Always remember, Paul was very intercessory in his prayer. Paul was always praying one for another. And if you don't know what to pray, it's like a camera. You could always focus the lens on the word of God, and you will be in focus to what you will pray, because there are things that we all are related to. Now... And we all relate to one another and things we're dealing with. We must be specific. Understand Psalm 145, 18. The Lord is near to all who call on him and all who call on him in truth. So pray the word of God for the saints. And Paul was well acquainted with prayer. And let me say this to you. I don't want to pray for the saints. I don't know how. Thank God for the people. Paul did that. Throughout his letters, we see it many times. Romans 1, 8 to 10. Philippians 1, 3 to 4. 1 Corinthians. And we see it in Colossians 1, 3. But Paul would also pray for the saints something we ought to pray as well. In spiritual battle. The purpose of our prayer, how we are pray. Paul prayed for wisdom and knowledge. Ephesians 1, 17. Paul prayed that the saints would be full of hope. Ephesians 1, 18. But there's one thing I would emphasize to you today. How are we to pray one for another? Generally, and certainly, when it comes to spiritual warfare, Paul would pray that we would grow in our love for one for another. 1 Thessalonians 3.12. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do. So, what are the devil's tactics? One of the schemes he's going to try to perpetuate here in this congregation and in throughout the congregations is to sow discord, is that we would not have one. We would have love for one another. We would not be one, that we would be in strife. Pray one for another, the preemptive prayer, so you mitigate that. So Paul would be strengthened with prayer and power when he prayed and he would ask for it. Well, for example, let's continue with how we ought to pray for the saints. Consider what he writes in Ephesians 1.18 to 19. I've alluded to it a little bit already. That you may know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might. His power, that's what we want. The Holy Spirit's empowerment, that's what I need. That's what you need. According to the riches of his glory in Ephesians 3.16, that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. You're going to need the power of God to continue throughout the battle. It's not going to cease. And we see, and we also, there's more that he writes in Ephesians 3 as well. So pray one another with the application that we are stronger together and that there is strength in numbers for all the saints that we may stand firm against the schemes of Satan. I'll pray that for you this week. You pray that for me and George, that we'll stand firm against his schemes, that we'll be able to recognize his schemes, that we will be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. Pray. Fight this fight with prayer. Okay, who else? And pray for me, Paul says, the servant. Paul is asking for prayer. Wow. The apostle Paul is asking the saints 
for prayer. A man who's been to the third heaven. A man who's planted church. A powerful man of God. No question. But Paul is not relying on yesterday's victories and yesterday's successes. He knows. He's wise. He needs prayer for today. I need prayer. You need prayer for today. Today has new challenges. And he's not relying on any track record. He's not relying on his apostolic credentials. He understands that God's strength is necessary today and tomorrow for this battle. And Paul is powerful, amen, but Paul understands. Christian, as you must understand, the source of your power is God, is the mighty God. Satan is no match, but when we're prayerless, then we're susceptible. He knows the source of his power. And Christian, don't fall into the trap that maybe some in Ephesus might have fallen into. That's Paul. I'm like, I'll pray for that, that, that poor guy over there. No, you pray for the leaders. Don't fall into the trap that that's Pastor George. I, I, I'll, pray, I'll pray for someone else. Pray for Pastor George every day. If you can, pray for me as well. Okay? Pray for the leaders. But what we see here is really the request is really something for the purposes that we're going to see. It's not necessarily for the leadership, as Paul might have had that. It's really for evangelism. But first, I want you to look at Paul's request in verse 19. And pray for me that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly, to make known the mystery of the gospel. Understand that Paul is not praying for his comfort. He's not praying for his safety. I mean, I think it would be a legitimate prayer. Lord, get me out of this house arrest here. Lord, won't I be better served to serve you? That wasn't the case. Paul is praying with a purpose here. Now, His purpose here is not to be out of the chains, but that he may not to be set free, but that he may have utterance to speak the mystery of the gospel. Now, what is this? To be of an effective witness, to have a boldness, as we're going to look at. The gospel message is something that we need to pray for as well, for all of those saints who should be sharing it, that utterance and clarity be given, and certainly for those missionaries, certainly for the pastors, certainly for the evangelists. Now, we are stronger together, and Paul knew that, because consider what he told the Philippians. In Philippians chapter 1, 3 to 5, I thank God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you with all joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul was the evangelist. Paul was the one going. But they were praying for his endeavors. You see, we may not be on the field in Papua New Guinea, but yet we should pray for the Jabellos. We may not be in other places in Nigeria, but yet we should pray for the persecuted church in Iran because the gospel is going forth for our missionaries. And we may not be at each one's dinner table where there's some evangelistic and missionary work going on as well, but pray one for another. That utterance may be given and clarity to the gospel. But he says here, the mystery of the gospel. Now let's consider what he writes here. Pray, I'll read the verse to you again, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. The ESV would say, I would speak clearly. Now, chapter 3, we saw the mystery revealed in Ephesians. And just to touch on it, what exactly is that? Well, that was the mystery of the Gentile now being grafted in to the olive branch. That was the mystery of the Gentile who was previously a stranger and a foreigner to the covenants of Israel was now being reconciled in the one new man in Christ. 
But let's continue here for the utterance before we get to that. The word can take on a connotation of freedom. Pray for divine appointments, we often pray. But pray that I would be free to speak. Pray that I would have the words and the clarity in the spirit to be open, to be frank, without concealment. Now, with boldness to preach the mystery of the gospel, a freedom in boldness, a fearlessness, not being fearful of man, to have a cheerful courage. Boldness is needed. Now, understand this is going to come by prayer. Understand what comes against us is supernatural. Understand, like I said, prayer is supernatural again. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10 Three to five. Do you think that's going to come from prayerlessness or prayer? It's going to come from prayer individually and collectively. John MacArthur has a very, very interesting thought here. That we would have the boldness to preach, right? MacArthur says this. Ephesians begins by lifting us up into the heavenly. He's referring to chapter 2, verse 6. We now sit in the heavenly places with Christ. But he says and ends by pulling us down to our knees. Boldness, courage, clarity. It comes not from our own strength, but from God's strength. It's the power paradox that we see in the New Testament. We are strong when we are weak. Power to surrender. It comes when we surrender in prayer. That's when the boldness is going to come. It comes through humility. Now some... Look at the Holy Spirit and the traits of the Holy Spirit and say, the Holy Spirit in Acts is all about speaking this unknown language. It's about this or that. One of the primary characteristics for boldness, for the utterance making known the mystery of the gospel, is the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, we see a trait. Boldness is given to those who prayed in the upper room. We saw that in the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit came on them. Those formerly terrified disciples became fearless practitioners and preachers of the mystery of the gospel. Well, in a short time later, the disciples faced persecution from the authorities. What did they do in Acts 4.29? They prayed for boldness, and their prayer was answered. And we looked at in the past messages, they prayed for boldness, and they spoke the word with boldness in Acts 4.31. And we saw in Acts 5, 19 to 20, after another persecution, after another imprisonment, they were right back at it, preaching in the temple. We noted about the fly who visited you when you were preaching the message some years ago. And then in our small group, we had that fly over the summer we couldn't get rid of. The boldness of these disciples was like the fly that will not leave against the devil's schemes against the persecution. There's a perseverance and a steadfastness there. And it comes with that paradox. First Peter 5, 6, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God and in proper time he will exalt you. Boldness, power, strength comes through our humility, through our recognition of our total dependence upon God. Okay, now we see this mystery revealed, and I'm going to read you what the mystery was, and then we'll continue. Chapter 3, here's the mystery, 3 to 6. That by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which other ages were not made known to the sons of men, has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. And here's the mystery. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of the promises of Christ. Remember Jesus in Matthew 24. That he came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But he also said in John 10, 14 to 16. I have other sheep that are not 
of this fold. So now the mystery has been revealed. The manifestation of the gospel given to all of us to propagate, to preach, to evangelize. In order to do this, we need utterance, courage, boldness, strength. And that's going to come when we pray one for another. So now we see verse 20. So pray for me, which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And certainly we see Paul is not asking. Again, free me from these chains. What concerns him most is the gospel. What concerns him most is that he knows he's effective in these chains. Whatever situation you're in, maybe it's not the best situation, but a Christian is to be bold in less than ideal circumstances. Our brothers and our sisters are dealing with that throughout all regions of the world. As we, if you come on, on Wednesday night, you will hear some stories that will probably change your perspective on evangelism, on the Christian faith, and certainly on prayer. But Paul understands that he is victorious, yet he's in chains. Now consider the priority of the gospel and the, how we ought to pray and for what purpose. Again, we go to Philippians 1, 12 to 14. I want you to know, brothers, that Paul, speaking of his house arrest, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard to the rest of my imprisonment for Christ. Paul understood, pray for me, I'm in chains, that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. We all ought to speak boldly. For the Lord has rescued us. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel is greater than me. It's more important than me. And the gospel is something that can get us out of our, kill our comfort zones as well. But we see the importance. We saw it in Canada. We saw it in the States during the pandemic, or as we now know was a pandemic. I don't say that to be facetious or to be a rebel rouser, but we ought to be Bereans in such a time as this. We see that many, as that situation looked like it would be doom and gloom, the gospel advanced during that as well. Now let's conclude with some conclu concluding thoughts. There are the benefits of prayer and the duty of prayer. Prayer will make us strong. We have to pray one for another for the wisdom of God, for our needs, their strength in numbers. But we see specifically here that we are to stand strong. How so? Against the schemes of Satan, by praying for one another. And what else? That the gospel will go forth, that we be strong in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's important to know that prayer, ex when we pray, we express our acknowledgement and dependence on God. This is non-negotiable. We need to do that. We have a trust in God. And one of the byproducts is the benefits. Prayer will bring us into a deeper fellowship with God. And you'll find when you're praying one for another, you'll have a deeper fellowship, perhaps with each other as well. So let's pray that the gospel go forth and that we are to pre preventive prayer, preemptive prayer and preemptive maintenance in our battle. Now, Christian, you are in a battle as we are going to conclude this passage. And some of you here may not be born again in Christ. Someone here may not say that Christ is Lord. Some of you may say, I have nothing against Jesus. But I think you people just take it a bit too far. Let me tell you something. There is no neutrality here in this war. You're either for Jesus Christ 100% or you're not. There is no middle ground. There is no neutrality. Jesus Christ, if you believe him that he came in the flesh, and you believe what he taught, I thought he had some good principles, then consider what he said. He who is not with me is against me. 
And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. You're either an ally of Jesus Christ, or the Bible says you're an enemy. That may sound harsh, that may sound severe. It's Christianity 101. That's biblical Christianity. I want to read you a passage, and then we'll conclude, and I want to ask you and exhort you to do something. Acts 17, 30 to 31. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because God Almighty, the creator, has fixed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. That man is Jesus Christ. The righteousness of Christ, no one can even touch. Any righteousness that you think the most righteous of all men has is but filthy rags. There is no righteousness apart from Christ. So I'm going to tell you and ask you to do something that Paul the Apostle Paul did. And it's for every Christian here to tell the whole world. 2 Corinthians 5.20 Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you. We're begging of you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. We're pleading with you. I'm pleading with you. This is not a Sunday thing here. This is life and death. Please be reconciled to God. And how do you do that? On Christ's behalf. For he made him, Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, so that we may become the righteousness of God. You're going to be judged by righteousness. 99% fails. It's not going to cut it. You need the righteousness of Christ. The only thing that separates me from someone here who's not called upon Jesus Christ as Lord is that I have the righteousness of Christ. Not by works of righteousness, which I have done, but according to God's mercy, did he save me. Wash me in regeneration and renew me in the Holy Spirit by grace, according to his mercy. By grace, by grace, by grace. I can do nothing for this. You could do nothing for this. But he who has ears to hear, let him hear the word of God. Who is this Jesus? He was prophesied 700 years prior by the prophet Isaiah and throughout the Old Testament. The mystery now is here. There's no more mystery. We see in Isaiah 53, he is despised and rejected. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. But this is what he's done in a perfect atonement for his people. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried out our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace, which should be your chastisement, my chastisement was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. You do not have the capacity to enter into the eternal life on your own works or any sort of religious system you were brought up with and in any infant baptism. It's simply not biblical. God will not acknowledge it. Please hear me. Hear me. Be reconciled to God. I implore you. Father God, we give thanks, Lord. We give thanks for your word, for your truth, Lord. And this is important, Lord. This is the most important message we'll ever deal with, that we ought to be reconciled. But Father, for your people here who are praying, Lord, one for another, I ask, Lord, before they leave, that they will ask one another what to pray for. They will look in the pages of Paul's letters and know how they ought to pray. And they will pray always without ceasing, being watchful, praying in the Spirit, praying one for another for the advancement of the gospel. 
knowing, Lord, that we must proclaim this with boldness, knowing, Lord, that it is the only means of hope. For you have appointed a day where you will judge the world in righteousness, but the gospel is the righteousness of God unto salvation. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.